thank you, Ellis, for the very kind introduction, and to the other members of the General Assembly, thank you all for being here today. The things I'm going to talk to you about would not have been possible without the support of our members of the General Assembly. Governors have some powers, but they have to have the consent and the approval and the support of the General Assembly to get major things done. And I have been very, very fortunate in that regard to have very cooperative members of the General Assembly. Now, I have to tell you that my wife would have loved to have been with us today. Many of you know my wife because she has now traveled all across this state trying to promote the importance of children learning to read at an early age. And she has visited well over 800 individual schools, pre-K through about the third grade, reading to children, trying to encourage them uh, to be able to read and to want to learn to read. So, but I can tell you what she's doing. She's been shaking hands with people who are coming through the front door of the governor's mansion. Because on Sunday night, we lighted the big tree there in the front yard of the governor's mansion. And for this week and next week, we will have visitors uh, coming to see the decorations. Now, those decorations this year, she selected a theme of the county courthouses of Georgia. And we have some beautiful courthouses scattered all across our state. We ask that each county send in some illustration of their courthouse. And the Christmas trees have been decorated with those ornaments and those photographs. And when the inmates in our prison system heard that that was going to be the theme, they went to work building miniature replicas of many of the courthouses in Georgia. And those are displayed in the governor's mansion. They are absolutely remarkable. So, if you have the opportunity, if you and your friends or your family want to come and see those decorations, uh, on her behalf and on mine as well, I would invite you to try to make a trip to Atlanta. I know it's a long trip, but I think you would like to see what your state governor's mansion looks like during the holiday season. Well, it is an important season of the year for all of us. We've just passed Thanksgiving, and we've had a lot of things to be thankful for. The Christmas season is another time when we recognize all the blessings that all of us have been given. The blessing that Sandra and I have been given for the last seven years and going into our last year as the first couple of Georgia is the opportunity to serve in that capacity. And I thank you all on both of our behalves for the opportunity you have afforded to us. We've enjoyed it. We've been through some tough times in Georgia. When I came into office in 2011, I quite frankly looked back on it and I said, you know, if I'd known all the bad things that the state of Georgia was involved in financially, uh, I'm not so sure I've been so anxious to try to run to be the governor. But we've come a long way in a relatively short period of time. And I'm going to tell you about some of those things. Uh, I'm going to start with um, the overall economy because that's where most people think about starting is in the overall economy. When, uh, when I came into office, we had been in a real severe downturn. Our unemployment rate had gone to about 10.4%, far above the national unemployment rate. The reason was Georgia has been a rapidly growing state. We had been building, we had contractors building subdivisions, building commercial properties, much of it speculative in nature. And when the Great Recession hit, it hit suddenly. It did not gradually creep up on us. And as a result of that, that part of our growing economy collapsed. Bankruptcies occurred, businesses went out of business, and it was a very tough time. The good news is, with the help of the General Assembly, we approached it in a realistic fashion. Unlike some states that looked at their economies that were suffering the same general consequences, they said, you know, we can't run our state government on less money than we had in the good times, so therefore in the bad times, we're going to have to raise taxes in order to make up the difference. I thank them all the time for those decisions that they made because Companies from their states did not respond well. How else do you account for the fact that Mercedes-Benz moved its 
American headquarters from New Jersey to Atlanta, Georgia. How else do you account for the fact that other businesses from all over the United States have moved their home offices, have moved their research and development activities, and in particular, many of their high tech uh, IT companies are moving here and are continuing to grow. So, we didn't raise taxes, we actually cut taxes. Because we asked the business community, what do you think it's going to take for us to be able to revitalize your part of Georgia? We had regional meetings. I think I may have attended the one that was down here when we were having uh, those regional meetings. And we asked the questions, what do you think it's going to take? There were a lot of questions that were asked and a lot of answers given. Education reform was one of the high priorities in every region of the state of Georgia. But for those who looked at the pure business side of things, they said, if you will remove the sales tax on energy, you will see a revival of manufacturing in Georgia. All of you know we used to be a major manufacturing state. It was, in many respects, centered on textiles and high labor-intense jobs, those went away. They went offshore, and they're not coming back in the form in which they left. But, here again, working with the General Assembly, we rolled back and finally eliminated the sales tax on energy used for manufacturing, and we've indeed seen our manufacturing sector grow significantly. So, what does it look like in numbers? Well, since January of 2011, when I became governor, we have now seen over 650,000 new private sector jobs that have been created in the state of Georgia. That is well above the national job growth average, and that number continues to grow all the time. We have seen our rainy day fund, which was virtually depleted. It sounds like a big number when you say that it was $116 million in 2011, but that was only enough money to run state government for about a day and a half. So one of the priorities that the General Assembly and I set was to rebuild and restore that rainy day fund. The good news is, the most recent report is, that we have built it back up to about $2.3 billion. And that is good news for all of us. governmental entity. Those of you who serve at the local and, and uh, county levels, you know that. Because when you do borrow money, you want to pay as little interest as you have to. And a good bond rating allows you to do that. Georgia has now, even during the lean years and the hard years, we have maintained a triple A bond rating for 20 consecutive years. And that is unprecedented. Even the federal government has not been able to do that. And that means that when we do borrow money and sell bonds, that you as taxpayers pay the lowest rate and in interest on those bonds of any state in the nation. And that allows us to use that money that would have been spent paying interest to do other things. So I am in fact very, very proud of that. Now, as Ellis alluded to, we had never, prior to 2013, been designated by anybody as the best state in the nation in which to do business. Now, just fairly recently, for the fifth consecutive year, Site Selection Magazine, one of the major publications that looks at and advises the investment and business community as to where should you be and where should you go if you're looking for a place to go, named us for the fifth consecutive year as the best state in the nation in which to do business. Now, Area Development Magazine, which comes out with their ratings uh, at a different time of the year, has for four consecutive years named us to that same designation. We're hopeful they will pick us up for the fifth year as well. But the point is, we have created an environment that is good for business and we are being rewarded for doing so. If you're out on the interstate in particular, 
now that we've gotten all the Floridians in, out, and back in uh, from the hurricanes, look at the tags and where they're from. I know in the metro Atlanta area, there are literally tags from all over the United States. And I don't think they're all just passing through. I think they're coming because Georgia has jobs. And that's what people come for, is jobs. If you don't believe it, how else do you account for the fact that in 2011 when I took office, we were the 10th largest population state. Today, we are the 8th largest population state. We've jumped over some of those states that have always been our competitors, North Carolina being one of them, and we have designated, our, we are now designated as the eighth most populous state in the United States. People continue to come. Now, I know those numbers, you would always ask the question, well, you told me what it has been statewide. Let me tell you what it's been locally for you. In the past two years alone, there have been six major economic development projects that have occurred in this county, working with our Georgia Department of Economic Development and your local chamber and your local economic development teams. And those, uh, two, those six major economic development announcements have resulted in almost 500 new private sector jobs and, and about $115 million in additional capital investment right here in your county. That is an outstanding record for your county. Since 2011, there have been 24 major projects here in your county. Most of them have been expansions, but expansions are jobs too. It doesn't have to be somebody new coming in. It can be somebody who's already here who likes where they are, and when they decide to expand, they decide, well, we like where we are. Let's just grow right here. And your county has been one of the great examples of that because all but two of those 24 have been expansions of existing businesses that are here. And that has resulted in about $175,650,000 uh, additional uh, dollars in capital investment and close to 1,800 new jobs since 2011. So y'all are doing pretty good. You've all worked very hard and you congratulate yourself. also reached beyond the borders of the state, and that is in international trade, and that is always a good thing. Exports from Valdosta in 2016 into the world total some $203.8 million. And in the past fiscal year, our Georgia Department of Economic Development's team has worked with eight companies in Valdosta and Lowndes County and assisted them in exporting to Canada. Latin America, Europe, and Asia. And that assistance has resulted in new export sales from your county in excess of $350,000. So, you're letting the world know about what you're doing right here. Now, tourism is also one of those areas where you have benefited greatly. We have had tourism expand in our state, and that's always something that the more we can get the message out to the world that Georgia is a great place to visit, and that there is more to Georgia than just Georgia on my mind. We want you to come have it in your eyesight. And they are visiting. They're visiting you. In fact, in uh, 2015, I'm told that the tourism industry here in your county supported some 2,653 jobs and generated some $282.4 million in direct tourist spending and created $11.8 million in state tax revenue, thank you, and generated about $8.7 million in local tax revenue. And I'm sure your elected officials at the local level thank you for that as well. And each year, uh, your households and your county are benefiting because of the lower tax burden that these assets and these uh, revenues bring into your community. Now, there are a number of other things that we have done. You don't get to be number one by just trying to do the same old thing, just doing it a little bit bigger. You have to be innovative in what you do. You have to get the attention of the world business community. Because that climate of businesses, you in the business arena know, 
is changing every day. We're trying to make sure we are part of those changes. First of all, one area that uh, has enlarged far beyond, I think, anybody's reasonable expectation several years ago has been the film industry. We had a film tax credit when I came into office, but it was not attracting the kind of attention that it needed to be to make us on the landscape. As of this past year, Georgia was named as the number one place in the world for major film production. And just a few months ago, we were designated as the number one state in the United States for this year uh, for film production. And that includes television, commercials, uh, normal, uh, long-time film production. And that is indeed a good thing. When it first came to Georgia, the film academy, I mean the film uh, industry, would simply select a beautiful place to shoot some sights, some scenes, and incorporate it into a movie. But we decided, you know, if we're going to give a tax credit, we need something that's going to be long term. Because actors come and go. They can pick up and take their film crews, and they can take their film sets, and they can just move if it's mobile, and most of it is. We wanted some permanency, and we have now begun to see that in, in great fashion. First of all, Pinewood Studios out of London, England. For the first time in that company's great history, the James Bond, the Harry Potter movies, that's who Pinewood is. They decided to come outside of, of London, and they selected the state of Georgia down in Fayette County, and they have built sound stages somewhere around 18 now. I understand they're shooting for well over 30. And they are full, and their business is booming, and they continue to grow. And that's good. You can't pick up a sound stage and move it. It's going to be here. They build it, they're going to be here. The, but it was an even more important part of the film industry in terms of permanency was for us to have Georgians with the skills to work in the film industry. You know, they can bring in lighting crews, they can bring in sound crews, they can bring in people that know how to build the sets, and they build those elaborate sets, and they tear them down faster than they put them up. They can build, they can bring those kind of people in. But we don't want them just bringing people in to do that. We want Georgians to have those skills so that when they decide to shoot a film in our state, they can simply find the right people who are already here and are trained with the skill set to get those jobs. And that has happened. And it is a part of something that I think is far too under-recognized in our state. And that is, several years ago, in the height of that you know, unemployment rate being so high, I asked the question and asked others to ask the question of the business community, do you have jobs that you can't find enough qualified people to fill? And the answer came back, yes, we do. Well, to me, if you've got high unemployment, you've got jobs available, and you don't have any Georgians able to fill those jobs, well, to do something to make sure they are able to fill those jobs. So working with the General Assembly, we would call it a high-sounding name, High Demand Career Initiative. Well, it was a high demand area, and the career initiative was associated with it. We now call it uh, Hope Career Grants, because these skills in those areas are primarily skills that our technical college system is able to convey and to allow to train students with those skill sets. We started out with four categories. One of them was just as simple as commercial driver's licenses. And believe it or not, we still have a shortage of people with CDLs. And as the Port of Savannah continues to have record years and more and more cargo and those containers keeps coming in, we need even more people with CDLs. And our technical college system is ramping up and they are offering those skill sets. Over the last four years, and now going into the fifth year, we're going to add five more categories for skills.
skill sets where we pay 100% of the tuition for someone who will go pursue one of these degree areas and the jobs are waiting on. Now this next beginning of the first of the year, those five, and I can't remember all five of them, but I can tell you a few of them. One is in aeronautics and aviation. Uh, we have a shortage in skill sets there. Another is in construction itself, just basic construction, because there are a lot of things being built in Georgia right now, and the uh, contractor community says they just cannot find enough qualified people. But it also includes things uh, such as uh, computing skills, early childhood education, um, the kind of skills that most of our businesses that manufacture things need, and that is welding. That is one of the highest demand areas that we have in our state. So we will have 17 areas where if a young person will pursue a degree or, or diploma in one of those 17 areas, the state will pay 100% of their tuition and they'll have a job waiting on them. In fact, the success rate has already indicated that of those who have gone through these programs, that 88.4% of them find a job in the, in the skill set area that they have been trained for. And even if they don't find a job in that specific area, 99.2% of them are finding a job. And that's the end game. I've always believed that education should lead to employability. I don't think there are a lot of parents that think that they uh, want their children to go off and get a college education or a technical college degree or anything like that and can't find a job, they come back and sleep in their basement. That's not what education is designed to do. It's designed to get you a job. So, with our workforce growing, with our increased opportunities for the state to pay for a person to get the skill set that they need to get a job, I think our future is indeed very bright. But you know you have to look beyond even the things that now there are jobs available. You have to look at what are the jobs of the future going to be. We had an opportunity and I think that uh, for us to not have seized the planet would have been a great mistake. The United States Department of Defense decided that they were going to move their cyber security under the United States Army cyber security from Fort Meade, Maryland, down to Fort Gordon in Augusta, Georgia. NSA already had a great presence there, and they too had decided to expand. We decided, you know, if the federal government's going to put the equivalent of over $2 billion of federal taxpayer money into this specialized area in this part of Georgia, the state of Georgia would be foolish not try to to not try to piggyback on that. So, we announced several months ago, in fact, we've already had the ground banking and the first buildings are going up over at Augusta in downtown Augusta, there on the riverfront, of building a cyber training facility in the state of Georgia. And then about two weeks ago, we kept hearing that they were having so many requests for space that the building we had intended to be the building was not going to be enough. So we have now put about $35 million more million into building a second building, which will be a part of that enterprise. Now this is going to be the cutting edge of the future jobs that your children and your grandchildren are going to have available. And they're not going to have to go somewhere else to some other part of the United States. We will very soon, in my opinion, when we are operational in that, and they're expecting it to be operational uh, into, in the latter part of next year. They're working in conjunction with our university system. Obviously, you know, Augusta University is right there. They're incorporating and creating new graduate courses to take advantage of this very specialized area of computer science. We're going to be training some of the best people in the world to deal with cybersecurity. And I hope they'll hurt and do it pretty good because my wife is still convinced that somebody's going to tap into 
our bank account. And I said, well, we won't lose a whole lot if that's all they get. <laughs> but we all worry about that. This is going to be a place where enterprises can have startup. They've got a good idea. They can come there and they can rent space and they have access to all of the things that they need to test their theories, to find out if their ideas are going to be marketable and to develop them if necessary. Also to train for purposes of the private business community, uh, to allow them to have training opportunities there. We are already seeing thousands of new jobs created in the Augusta Richmond County area as a result of these activities. They're coming even before we got the building open. And one of the real reasons that uh, we decided to build that second building was because this first one's going to sit right there on the banks of the, of the uh, uh, Savannah River. And you can just see South Carolina right across the river over there. And we were hearing rumblings that they were going to try to take advantage of us not having enough space and they were going to build something on their side of the river. I said, oh, no, sir. We put our money out first. We had the idea first. We're not going to allow people to go just because we don't have room for them. So when your young people get interested in this arena, and I think a lot of them will be, they all have a place that they can go right here in the state of Georgia, not too far from your home, and be able to become experts in a field that is going to continue to be important for the future of our country uh, and literally for the world. Quickly, another a few topics I want to touch on. And one, of course, is, is education. And that is K through 12 education. That is the building block of, uh, of where we need to go in our state is to continue to focus on that. Uh, we have done that during my administration. In fact, uh, to give you some comparisons, in fiscal year 2012, uh, we allocated over $6.9 billion to K-12 education. In fiscal year 18, which we're in that budget cycle now, we're allocating over $9.4 billion for K-12 education. For the last two years, we have built money into the budget for pay raises for our teachers. The first year, we gave a 3% merit increase I understand not every school system gave it, passed it on to the educators. That's a shame because that's what the money was put there for. And this past year, we designated that it would be 2% pay raise for our teachers. And that cost about $160 million, just a 2% pay raise for our teachers. So we're trying to do what we can. The legislature uh, passed a bill this past session, and I signed it into law. Uh, it was called the School Turnaround Bill. I met with the chief turnaround officer that has been selected for that yesterday. I met with him, and he is going to try to come in and help those schools that are in those lower categories of performance, try to help them turn themselves around so that no child in this state is denied a, an adequate and good education simply because of their zip code. And unfortunately, that is happening today. We need to change that. I believe he's going to be a great guy. He is a, he's a Savannah native. He's an African-American educator. And he has the highest credentials in our state school board that had the responsibility for selecting the chief turnaround officer, has hired him. And uh, I'm sure that your education community is going to have an opportunity to see him and to talk to him and to be able to see that he's, going to, he's a person with the right kind of heart. He just wants to make things better, and that's all that any of us want to do for our state. Quickly, um, transportation. Some of your elected officials have been the real leaders in the General Assembly in this particular arena. Uh, House Bill 170, which was the funding bill that was passed in 2015, has allowed our state to take on major transportation projects that would not have been otherwise available to us but for this piece of legislation. We have 11 major transportation projects that are going to be funded by this revenue over the next 10 years. Most of those big projects relate to interstates, uh, including things like hopefully being able to put, for the first time I understand, anywhere in the United States, a dedicated truck lane on I-16, where we've had so many horrible accidents with vehicles 
coming into contact with, with large trucks. So those are the kinds of projects. Uh, passing lanes, additional lanes on areas that are extremely congested, and of course a lot of those around Atlanta are extremely congested. But it took, it took, it took a hard vote by the General Assembly to pass that. It's too easy to say no. <clears throat> it's too easy to let your fellow colleagues carry the burden when you're voting on something that sounds like a tax increase. But you know, there's a difference between a tax increase and a, a user fee. Our, general, our money is generated by gasoline tax, and you don't have to pay it if you don't use something that uses gasoline. And on that topic, to the members of the General Assembly, we've already recognized that the increased use of vehicles on our highways that don't use gasoline is going to put us at a disadvantage and we're going to have to continue to look at it. We've made some adjustments on those uh, hybrid vehicles already and the funding formulas, but that's going to be a challenge in the future because almost every state in the country, in fact, every state in the country, depends primarily on gasoline tax as their funding source for keeping up their roads and their bridges doing repairs and doing improvements. So it will be an ongoing challenge, but we are way ahead of the game. We have people from all over the country wanting to come and talk to our DOT officials and say, how did you do this? Because we are seen as the state that is leading the nation in terms of the way we approach transportation and infrastructure improvement. You would not have seen uh, the bridge collapsed on I-85 repair in six weeks record time had it not been for the fact that we had the resources to be able to engage the private contractor community to offer financial incentives for them to do the work on a round-the-clock basis and get it repaired in record time. We are acknowledged as number one in the nation in terms of financing for our infrastructure. I'll mention briefly what Ellis talk to you about, and this is one of the areas I am very proud of, and that is criminal justice reform. Quick overview. When I took office in 2011, we were, as I told you, the 10th largest population state, but we had the 4th largest prison population. I don't think Georgia is that much meaner than everybody else in the United States. But we were having the old philosophy that had been in place for a long time to get in trouble, and you're convicted, send them to prison, lock them up, throw away the key, don't worry about it. Well, that doesn't work. It wasn't working for our state. Our recidivism rate was that about uh, out of one out of every three adults in our system that was released was coming back in three years or less. About 65% of our juveniles were coming back in three years or less. And we have a system that was broken and we couldn't sustain it. I was told in my first four year term, I was gonna have to build two new adult prisons, gonna cost $264 million and that our prison population was going to be well over 60,000 by the time we got around to building those prisons as of last year. Well, we didn't build those prisons last year. We didn't need to. We were able to transform some of our existing prisons into transition centers, to daycare centers, because the community in our state stepped up. Our General Assembly set the tone we made major reforms in our, in our criminal justice system. The main one at the beginning was accountability courts. And as those names imply, that is giving people who made a mistake the second chance. And most of those who made those kind of mistakes related to some kind of addiction, alcohol, drugs, or a combination of both of them. But we have seen a growth of our accountability courts, drug courts, DUI courts, mental health courts, and veterans courts veteran community, and yours is one that has a high veterans population, uh, they have unique issues and they also have access to unique solutions through our VA system. So these courts are continuing to take the pressure off of our prison system to give people a second chance. So instead of being 60,000 in our prison system as of last year, as was predicted with no changes, we're down to about 53,000. And the percentage of those who are in our prisons are decidedly higher in terms of those who are violent criminals. Before, we were asked the question, why are you locking up so many people that you classify as nonviolent by your own standards? 
but you're putting them in a nineteen thousand dollar prison bed. That doesn't make much sense to most people. And I want to thank your judicial community here, uh, the judges, the district attorney, uh, the support staff that make these accountability courts work. I want to thank them for doing a good job because they are saving us all money. They are making our community safer. If you can turn around a person who's made a mistake and is willing to take an opportunity to change the direction of their life early on, you are avoiding crimes in the future. And the same thing is true with those who are in our prison system. If they are coming into our prison system, and the most common characteristic, when I asked them to find out what was the most common characteristic of prisoners, it was that they dropped out of school. Almost seven out of every ten dropped out of school. They don't have a high school education. I said, well, we can fix that. We were doing some GED programs, but now we've contracted with a private charter school to come into our prison system and give them the opportunity to get a real high school diploma to en enhance our GED program. And we have thousands of inmates in our prison system who are doing exactly that. Many of you know that the men who work at the governor's mansion, most of them, are inmates. They're at a local transition center there in Atlanta. We had one the other day who just graduated magna cum laude with his degree. He did it all by correspondence, but he was dedicated to that proposition. That's what we have to do. We're sending our technical college into the prison system to train them on such things as welding, to give them an opportunity to get a commercial driver's license or a truck, a CDL. In the last six weeks, I have been to two county prisons. County. They're not state. they got state prisoners, but they're, they're run by the local counties. They're setting up welding shops in their county correctional institute. They're training those inmates who are on a shorter term in terms of incarceration than those sent to our prison system. They're training them with a skill where they can go get a job. We're giving certificates to those who are paroled who have taken advantage of these educational opportunities and these skill opportunities. We're giving them certificates that they can take to a prospective employer and say, this is what I have done. Now, we're also trying to set the example, and I call on those of you in the business community to follow this example. Too often, no matter what they have done to try to change the direction of their life, they can't get a job because they have a felony on their record. I said, you know, the state of Georgia has a lot of jobs. We will set the example. We will do what they call ban the box. And what does that mean? Every job application has a lot of questions you have to answer. You have to check the boxes. Yes, 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 whatever. One of those questions always is, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Well, if you're in our state prison system, that's the reason you're there. So you have to check the box. How far do you think those applications get on human resource officer's desk? About as far as the trash can is located from that desk. That's about it. Well, we changed the policy for the state. We said that if you apply for a job that the state is offered and you have a felony, if you want that job, we will give you the opportunity for a face-to-face -face interview with someone in that department so you can tell them what you have done to change the direction of your life, to show them what you have done to acquire skills that are important and would qualify you for that job. I challenge you in the private business community to do the same thing. Give these people an opportunity to tell you and to show you what they have learned and what the, how they have changed. You will be surprised. Those that are working in the governor's mansion as they transition out over the time we've been there, I try to help them find a job. And for those that I've been able to help find a job, their employers come back to me and say, hey, if you got any more like that, please send them my, my way. There are two things that keep those who are in our system and being paroled from being successful when they re-enter society. One is a job. So the private business community has to step up. You have to be willing uh, to be able to give these people a chance. We have passed legislation that will give you some protection to say that you cannot be sued. If you have employed one of these individuals, you cannot be sued on the simple basis that you have employed a former felon. Because, you know, that's what 
I'm a trial lawyer. That's what trial lawyers sometimes want to do is to point the finger and say, all that really matters is that that was a convicted felon that was paroled and you put them on your payroll. Whether they had anything in the world to do with whatever the incident that they're talking about uh, has to do with it. So, we're trying to set the example at the state level. I challenge you to do the same thing. Jobs is one of the two primary obstacles that they face. The second one is housing. I've challenged everybody at the federal level from the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, Dr. Carson was in Atlanta uh, a few weeks ago, and I had a chance to sit right next to him at a banquet. And I'd already met with his regional supervisor, and I told her, I said, you know, we can't find housing for people who are being paroled out of our prison system. If they don't have a place to live, how do you think they're going to be successful in re-entry? I said, you can do something about it. I said, first of all, do you realize that almost every housing authority in this state and probably the entire country will not allow someone that has been a convicted felon to have a rental unit in their housing units? And the answer was, oh, well, those are, those are policies set by the local housing authority. And I said, yes, and how much money do they get from you through your federal budget that keeps them going? You control the purse strings. You can overrule those kind of policies. Now, I'm not saying that they have to take everybody, but I am saying they ought to have some kind of a quota in their system that allows some of these returning citizens who have shown that they are willing to do the right thing to have a place to live. Otherwise, everything we have done will go for naught if they don't have a place to live and a job. So, y'all can help us with the jobs. You can also help us with a place for them to live. And I would challenge you to do that. I conclude with this. We're number one in the nation in terms of meaningful criminal justice reform. We're number one in the nation as a place in which to do business. We're number one in the nation and in the world in terms of film production. We are number one in a lot of areas. We've got to keep pushing because the world is always changing. And we need to be sure that we stay ahead of those changes. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you for what you do.
Uh, for us in Valdosta, our program will supply a book to a child who enrolls in the program, one book a month, until they're five years old. And all of us know the importance of reading and for our ability to step in with books for young people, it can teach them the lifelong love for reading. We also sponsor the Traveler's Assistance Program for patients and their families at South Georgia Medical Center. Um, the, the stories where we do get calls from the hospital, it can just touch your heart how simply giving a family a ride from North Florida up here uh, when a family member is having an emergency, it, it just also touches your heart. I'd also like to introduce today the Y League students from Hayhara and Lowndes Middle Schools. Would y'all stand just very briefly? These middle schoolers come to our one of our club meetings once a month. We're lucky to have them. The Wild League program is the Youth Leadership Exploration and Development. That's a mouthful uh, school program, but that mouthful is, uh, of that program instills leadership and service skills throughout the community service activities for those who are going to become the leaders of. Lowndes County and Valdosta. Part of that is teaching the students that to be a good leader, you first have to be a good servant. Governor Deal, we want to thank you again for being with us. Let's give the governor another round of applause. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have our governor in South Georgia. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.